pants are typically, I don't want to say rigid, but you know, very specific in terms of goals, what we're looking for, et cetera. And because in this project, we wanted this to be really organic and come from you all who are out there in the field struggling with these issues every day, uh, we wanted the grants to be flexible uh, and, again, to be organic, coming instead of coming top down from our two departments, to really be coming from the field uh, so that um, we could learn from a lot of different experiences that, that folks would have out there. And so it was pretty simple. We wanted to see collaboration. Most of these kids often struggle between uh, various uh, departments. And so, again, we wanted both uh, mental health and addiction and, and developmental disabilities involved in each of these projects, as well as looking at uh, multi-county kinds of projects. So that was uh, how we kind of envisioned this. Again, real, real flexible, organic sort of, of project, focusing on kids who oftentimes are creating a, a lot of pain for their families as well as for themselves. The governor identified $5 million in one-time resources that could be used for this grant program. And ultimately, over the course of the biennium, 46 counties uh, participated and received some of these resources. And many of the projects were multi-county, um, but it gave us an opportunity also to work with the evaluation teams from universities, uh, three different universities, to um, track outcomes. And that then helped us make the pitch for additional resources in our current biennium. Yeah, so we're really pleased that in the current biennium, uh, we have $6 million, about $3 million in each year of the biennium. It allows us to continue some of the good work uh, that was going on in current projects, as well as funding a new project, which we'll talk about a little later in the presentation. So I think for, for our agency, this has really been um, another way that we're supporting local collaboration, and uh, we look forward to successes and really implementing some of the lessons learned as well from the last two years in this next biennium. I'd like to provide an example now of a family that has been um, positively affected by some intervention in the community. Uh, Deborah is featured in this next video. She's been raising her grandson, Rashawn, and she felt really isolated and treated differently because of the circumstances uh, related to Rashawn's uh, struggles. And so for a long time, no one would, would deal with Rashawn and really help to address the issues, not even the school. I've had Rashawn since he was two years old. He was doing When you have a child getting period eyes. Okay. When you have a child who's got special special needs, or they have motion behavior, or a child that just speaks his piece but don't understand that he might be offending someone. People treat you this. And for a long time I couldn't find anybody to deal with great jobs, not even the school. And I just think it's an awesome, awesome program, and I'm glad that somebody introduced us to this program. Okay, well, Deborah's story kind of provides an, an introduction to uh, some of the work that has happened over the past couple of years. A couple of times throughout the course of this project, we have brought uh, grantees together, and they have shared uh, with each other what they've been working on and things that have been happening. So we're going to use that same format uh, here this morning. And I'd like to introduce Tina Evans and Holly Jones from the Department of Developmental Disabilities and the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, respectively. They are our coordinators of this um, uh, project, and they're going to be um, facilitating a discussion with some of the grantees around the state of Ohio now. 
Hi, I'm Tina Evans with the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. I've been involved with Strong Family Safe Communities now for the past three years and had the pleasure of reviewing proposals um, all three years. Um, I would like to uh, introduce Alice Cady from the Hamilton County Board of Developmental, D D Developmental Disabilities, as well as Kay Spurgel, the Executive Director of the Licking Knox Mental Health and Recovery Services Board. Hi, I'm Holly Jones. I'm the co-lead for the Strong Family Safe Communities Project, and my role is mostly one of support and technical assistance to the project lead. I was part of the review team for the application submitted last spring, and now I am administering the funding and helping review the program implementation plan. It's my pleasure to introduce Christy Hirsch. She's the Director of Therapeutic Intervention Services for the Envision Project called Integrated Treatment Team for Children and Adolescents with Co-Occurring ID, DD, and BH Issues. I'm also pleased to introduce Patty Fetzer. She's the Manager of Service Delivery for the Mental Health and Recovery Services Board of Stark County for the project Helping Ohio's Children and Youth in Crisis. Now we'd like to ask our panelists some questions. So the first question is to Patty. Several common themes have emerged from the first two years. One of those is respite. And what did you learn through your project regarding respite? <clears throat> well, in our, in our counties that we serve, we too really appreciated being able to be organic and let the service providers that we're working directly with the youth and families really identify what they needed. We put in dollars for respite, but what we found was your traditional respite wasn't what they were, um, the youth and families were needed, particularly the older youth. Um, what we found was they wanted and needed connected and reconnected, like you heard from the family in the video, to school. Um, a lot of young people had been disconnected and on home instruction in their schools. We had parents that even needed reconnected to employment. We saw a lot of need for mentors that could take young people out and connect them to pro-social positive activities that promote their youth development, promote their self-esteem, decrease their isolation, decrease their stress. Um, you find a lot of young people that had been pushed out of their housing options, and we needed dollars to support creative housing options. We needed to partner with our DD providers that had access to supports that we could be putting in the home um, to be able to support them with daily living and skills. So it was a variety of things that kind of came out um, naturally from just listening to the, to the disconnected families and young people that, um, that we met with. Question um, again for Patty: um, How has collaboration been critical in your project? Well, number one, um, it was important that we collaborated with our surrounding counties. Young people and families cross over county borders regularly. Um, many times, their school districts cross over county borders, um, and we saw the value in each of our county partners and what each of us could bring to the table. We shared training together, which decreased the cost. We looked at the assets and the learnings that each counties have already kind of learned and are doing better. The other key thing coming from a mental health and alcohol and drug side of things is the developmental disabilities partners were vital. Um, because you, and I'm looking at Director Martin and I'm looking at Tina Evans, what you provide in terms of accommodations, in terms of supports that you can provide on site and homes. Um, that go over and above what sometimes we can provide on the mental health side has been awesome. And so our developmental disability partner is a key part of the team. Whether or not they are found eligible for developmental disabilities, they still stay in the team process because there are accommodations and supports and just um, their specialization that they can provide to what families and, and youth that have been disconnected um, need. How did you structure your project so it could be sustainable, and why is this important? Um, during our first grant period, starting in 2013, we really utilized the money to put forward towards our center-based intervention program for children and adolescents. And we found a lot of things to be really effective with it, uh, looking at biopsychosocial assessments, use of trauma-informed biographical timelines, uh, cross-systems intervention planning, really helping the DD side understand the mental health interventions and the mental health side understanding the DD-derived interventions that really melded together to help children and adolescents make progress. And what we learned from this is that it's a high-cost service. And so we had to 
kind of start chipping away and figuring out how can we make this program sustainable in the long run. And we found that running a center-based program in the long run was really not feasible with the current billing structures. So we took our learnings um, from the initial grant period and applied it to more of a community and home-based model where we're, we'll still be wrapping around the family, um, honing in on therapeutic services that can be both within the home as well as in the child's community, looking at school-based services, and how can we help both systems come to a common understanding, speak the same language, but have long-term sustainable outcomes because it meets with the current billing mechanisms that are available for Medicaid. Helen, first question for you. As you know, our department has partnered on the trauma-informed care initiative, and we would like to know how you have infused trauma-informed care in your initiative. Well, our project is the Resilience Project, and what we are doing is um, we're bringing trauma-informed support to people that in our multi-systems team, which are people who have had some uh, issues through uh, multiple systems and court involvement, and some of them are very poor, and their, um, their uh, outcomes have been not so successful with traditional mental health treatment. Um, many of these people have ACE scores of seven or above and have a lot of uh, extreme risk for serious behaviors and um, health disorders as time goes on. So what we're doing first is that uh, we developed a uh, project workbook, which is the Resilience Approach Workbook, and it has all the tools. It's a toolkit for people to actually work with people on this uh, trauma-informed approach. Um, it's, uh, the, the first uh, key point is that everybody gets training on this approach because it's a system issue. Everybody needs to do that. Uh, the next step that we, um, we do is the biological timeline. And this was really kind of developed uh, by Mary Vicaria of Finding Hope Consulting. And uh, basically, you get everybody in the room who knows this individual put a big piece of paper on their wall. And you say, OK, what happened to Johnny? Um, and people start putting him early on um, throughout the, the timeline of this person's life. And uh, you, it's, it's a powerful tool to use because people will actually say, oh, but I forgot his father when he was two years old went, um, was convicted and went to prison. Uh, so there's things that have happened to this child uh, throughout its life, and it's very, very powerful to see it all in writing and, and to relate when the behavior started according to what happened, what kind of trauma the person experienced. So we're using that as well. <clears throat> and then we, uh, we look for resiliency factors, and uh, we try to incorporate that in the treatment then for this individual, like um, having a sense of belonging and uh, being successful at doing something so that they can, instead of uh, drinking or uh, being promiscuous with some of the, the uh, outcomes of the trauma, they can have positive uh, factors in their life. And then we make sure that their um, service and support administrator or their case manager actually um, is, uh, has trauma informed and carries it throughout for all the different um, aspects of this person's life. So that's basically what we're doing. We're working very closely with two mental health agencies, um, Lighthouse Youth Services and LifePoint Solutions, which is the Greater uh, Cincinnati Behavioral Health, and uh, working um, with them as well. So it's, it's a great program. Thank you. And Kay? Um, what local systems and partners have you engaged, and how? And why was this important? Well, first, in Lincoln and Knox County, we have this long, very rich history of really good local collaborations surrounding our kids and our families. And this is predominantly through Children and Family First Councils. We have a very strong value of keeping our kids in the community and supporting our families in the process, or if we have to make a difficult decision along with a family for a child to be placed out of the home, they're still our kids. And so we take a lot of responsibility in their lives. That all being said, um, I think even prior to the, the release of the Strong Family Safe Communities granting opportunity, we had started having some discussions among um, community leadership. And these would be my colleagues at Juvenile Court, um, Dublin Family Services, um, 
Children's Services, oh goodness, um, our, our system providers, and certainly the Fourth and DC, to say, oh my goodness, look what happened in these communities. We think here we have this wonderful system of care and the families get access, but maybe we need to take a really hard look at ourselves to really figure out whether families are comfortable moving and coming forward to us. Because certainly in the tragedies that we have experienced over the years, one hallmark that we keep hearing from families is isolation and this horrible fear stigma. So we took a really hard look at ourselves and decided that we were not nearly as easy to access as we thought we were. And when we started talking to families, what we began understanding is that families were afraid to come forward. They were afraid of being judged. They were afraid of being determined that they were just not good parents and somebody else um, would judge them or think that they were incapable. Um, the biggest fear a lot of families had was children's services was going to take away their children. So chances are we did not see these people until things were so horrible that they ended up into an emergency room and things have really gone south. So we decided to, as a group, come up with um, our mobile urgent treatment team, which is our kids' mobile um, uh, response unit. And this unit um, is something that is easily accessible. Um, and instead of requiring that people come to us, we go to them on their turn. Um, and how this is so important for local um, partnerships is each one of us pull together to be able to pull this team up. And so a team is very flexible. If it's a parent who has a child that has a predominant um, problem with the development of disability that's coming into crisis, we'll work with um, our local board of DD to pull together a team that can go up and, and, and help that child. If it's a child and family that has an issue that's related to both um, a developmental disability and or a potential emotional problem, we'll send out representatives from both groups. It's whatever it, it takes for us to do this. And so um, the immediate team um, is um, both boards of DD, um, behavioral health care partners of Central Ohio, who is our uh, predominant um, contract provider for mental health and addiction services, provides our crisis workers, health officers, as well as our kids and adult teams. Um, Pathways of Central Ohio 211, who provides immediate access into the team 24 7. Um, and then, of course, both boards of DD for Licking in Knox County, as well as the um, Village Network, who is, um, provides respite and very short term residential treatment care if necessary. But we also have some very important partners that we could not do this without, and that's law enforcement. Um, we have an enormous amount of CIT officers and crisis intervention team officers trained in each county. Um, and we provided them with additional training and they've been part of the planning process. And so that's how local partnerships have been so tremendously important in making this a very robust process, but also for us to continue the discussion about how we can have better access to families, not be so difficult for them to figure out how to get the care and support that they need. Thank you. So this question is for all of you um, to respond to. What kinds of supports are you investing in, and how do these differ from traditional behavioral health treatment services? One of the key things, again, as we started our first year and we were listening to what was happening, we checked with our crisis center. Um, lots of young people that we talked to were saying they don't um, call on the phone even during typical times. The majority of their conversation is through text. And so we thought, let's check with our local crisis center and let's really look at the data, the numbers of young people and families that are calling into our local crisis center in times of need. We found astronomically that number to be way lower than we even imagined. And so through research um, and really looking at knowing that this is the way young people, even families, uh, communicate is through texting, we came across um, Crisis Text Line Incorporated, which is out of New York, but has started a, a national text line. And we started communications because in, in working with our partners with uh, Mental Health and Addiction Services and Developmental Disabilities, they said, OK, go ahead and pilot a text line. But we didn't want to recreate something that's already been created. And it became an awesome partnership because they have the whole platform. They have the um, you know everything you need to manage a text line. They do the training of, um, of the folks on the other side that were responding. So it's been it's been fabulous. Our schools are putting the posters out, um, marketing that text line number, even in their bathroom stalls, places that young people can see it and they can text at any hour. 
um, we started to see the data come in that shows um, that young people were starting to use that service, but we saw they were starting to use that service during the school time. Well, of course, that was because we were marketing it during school time. Once we hit um, going into the summer and created, and you'll see on the, on the video, um, we actually had young adults, college students that had created their own um, media company. And young adults are usually a lot better at media um, than we are. And they created this video, quick video, that we have been able to put up with the funding, thank you, um, literally on the movie screen. So those previews, you're able to see that. Within one month, our data showed that we went up 200 conversations of text. And so we're looking and continuing to look at where are we reaching, how are we reaching, um, and if that's the way they need to communicate is through texting, then we need to work harder um, as a community to make that resource available. But we're also having conversations, too, with our agencies that are serving this age group and asking them how are they using texting as part of their strategies at their front door. So it's not just a service, but how are we encompassing this in the work we do moving ahead. I, I think for us with the kids mobile team, um, we had predicted in the first year or so that we would serve maybe 150 children and their families or youth and their families. Um, and we doubled that. So we, we served easily 300. Since the team first began back in 13, we're in our third year of funding, we have served 450 children and their families, which is double what we thought we would. And one of the main focuses behind the team in trying to make access easier and less complicated for families and certainly um, less um, stressful and threatening um, was to search out particularly families that had never had any connection with our service. And so of the 450 odd families that we've worked with, 354 of them were brand new sources and never wow. been served before. Mm -hmm. So for us, because of getting out of our office, getting out of our comfort zone, um, really trying to decide what what is more comfortable for a family, letting the family drive a safety plan, letting the family drive the process, people have slowly begun to feel more comfortable with the approach. And I really think that that has been really critical to us in terms of doing early intervention. I think that we've also just begun to measure once you know, family and their, their child or, or youth is actually in service, um, the team stays with the family and the young person until they're actually in care and then um, once they're comfortable with that process and then they, they leave that. Um, what we've discovered is I think we have somewhere at 90, 120 days at least, um, I want to say somewhere between 65 to 70 percent of kids and families still remaining in treatment. And so it, it's we're hoping this is, is a way of helping people you know, feel more comfortable at entering care and remaining there. I think the other thing that for us is the funding, which was just such a godsend, um, did for us, is it allowed us as a team to send out more than one person. Normally you can't bill. Mm -hmm. Well, with this, we could actually send out a really good mm -hmm. team that we can mm -hmm. bill for. Right. We also, it allows people to take the time they need to do their paperwork, do their planning, make all those calls. Um, and I will say that as a system, we took what we learned um, from this process and for all crisis services now, that's how we fund it. Um, so we learned a lot of lessons as a result of this. Um, for this current fiscal year, we're just slowly rolling out a project of what to do with much younger children under the age of eight. We did some focus groups with um, providers of early childhood education and mental health services for both counties. They both said, wow, this is such a, such a great approach. Could we figure out developmentally how to use it for younger children? Mm -hmm. So we're just beginning to explore what that means for working with a much younger child and their family. Mm -hmm. And for us, one of the big, um, biggest pieces that we've put a lot of stake into is really having a better understanding, not only for us to understand our individuals in trauma-informed care, but it's also from a much more larger perspective, looking at it from our agency really investing in understanding the trauma that our employees, that our contracted foster family providers sustain by caring for some of the individuals who have chronic, persistent, long-term needs, um, and helping come around how can we better support them in the long run. So we really reduce and mitigate the burnout factor uh, for a lot of our employees. And these are the people who would walk away from our individuals, leaving them, you know, another person walking out on their life. So we're really trying to look at it from a much broader 
perspective, in the end being we're going to better help the individuals we support by reducing their trauma. And I think our program, the way it differs from traditional behavioral health and DD services is that we only saw the tip of the iceberg, which was the symptoms that people were having. Uh, with the trauma-informed care, which is the underlying fact of why they're having those symptoms, uh, we're able uh, to use the resiliency project to identify the trauma and to find the resiliency factors so that we can they can go about their business and live their lives um, as they want to without exhibiting all their symptoms. Um, and it's been very successful, especially with some of the multi-system folks. They're now not offending, reoffending. And they're interested now in employment, which is not what's not on their radar before. So it is, it's been very successful for us, and we hope to continue that discussion with the project. Okay. Okay. Director? Do, do we have a video on the texting thing? Something on the. Yes, Okay, thanks. Well, first, you know, to all of uh, our, our panel members here, it's really neat to, number one, just get a sense of the commitment you have to serving both families and the individuals with these complex issues that often our systems uh, struggle with, as well as, you know, the creativity that everybody exhibited and how you leveraged uh, each other's skills from the various systems to, uh, to make life better for folks. So next we want to we want to listen to another uh, individual's story, that of uh, Mahalia. And as all of us I think know, a lot of the folks that we serve really struggle with transitions. And this is I think an example of uh, an individual, Mahalia, kind of transitioning from one setting. She was in a uh, an adult foster setting to being more independent in an apartment and uh, how wraparound services, particularly using a mentor, and I think all of us benefit from mentors in our life, but particularly folks that are in our service systems really benefit from those kind of examples. So let's, uh, let's listen to Mahalia's story. My name is Mahalia. I am a B-25. So, well, I have a, kind of a okay background, but I, my wife's a grand. It kind of helped me get through some of the more problems I've had before. <laughs> we um, volunteered at a animal shelter. She, every Tuesday, she would come meet me up and we'd make her with the water and walk. It was not that we were taught at all, we would go to, when it was cold out, we would go to the rec center over in our brand, She would kind of help me keep my spirits up. She would help me build my self esteem and stuff. So we need those ways for the hair of her hair retired team to start and talk about progress she's making and the challenges she's facing, what we need to do with her as a team. She's had a lot of changes this past year. She moved out of the adult foster home. She has her own apartment with her roommate, which has had its own challenges. But she is maturing. Um, she's taking a lot more responsibility as she takes her medication. She has um, some alone time. She is making some safer choices, I think, overall. Um, she's doing a lot of taking care of herself and another step there. She's doing pretty well. What I like to do during the day is read books, be in the community, listen to music. Some of 
likes to go down to town. She's very active. She always likes to be doing something. So she's always calling her family or staff or somebody to go come pick her up. She likes to spend time with her family. You've been able to see through the um, videos today and hear through the panel discussion some of the really a wide variety of investments that have been made to um, help address different sort of gaps that exist in communities. And you've been able to see really some, some um, examples of success and, and what this has done for families throughout the state. Um, to that end, we are delighted to be able to announce uh, earlier this summer the grantees for this fiscal year. Um, $3 million funded 13 projects that transcend 43 counties in Ohio. And um, I encourage you to look at um, either of the department's websites to uh, get write-ups on the uh, various initiatives that are going to be undertaken with these funds, as well as uh, points of contact locally if you have any additional questions. And um, just was was the case with this last biennium, we will continue to stay connected to these grantees to understand um, you know, and help overcome any obstacles that may be presenting and really just um, learn from these experiences so that we can um, push forward more progress in other communities in the future. So as we noted earlier, uh, a fair amount of the money that we have in this new biennium is allowing us to sustain projects that were already underway. And then we also have a new uh, grantee, uh, which is the Ross County Board of Developmental Disabilities and its partners. And Leah Snyder, who is the superintendent of the DD board in Ross County, is going to talk a little bit about the project that they're about to undertake in Ross County. Yes, uh, we are collaborating with partners across Ross and Pickway counties. Um, those partners include the Ross and Pickway County Boards of Developmental Disabilities, um, Pickway County and South Central Ohio Job and Family Services. Toyota Paint Valley Mental Health Center and Integrated Services for Behavioral Health. Um, as we've gotten started, we've also worked very closely with our Family and Children First Councils in both counties, and they've been very helpful to getting involved. Um, we identified three areas that we really want to focus on. Uh, one of those is to raise community awareness and involvement, um, to provide respite and other support services for families, and to ensure access to coordinated crisis intervention services. And what we have found uh, through talking to people from agencies and individuals and families is that we do have services available in the community, but either they have strict eligibility guidelines or families aren't accessing them because there is that fear of children's services or a stigma associated with the services. So that's why a lot of our upfront work is going to be on raising awareness, getting information out there, um, providing training and helping connect individuals and families to others. Um, rest is going to be a big focus because that's one of the things that uh, we've heard over and over again is that families feel like if I just had a little bit of time to breathe, then I think I could come back refreshed and um, feel better able to help provide services um, to my loved one. So that's really where our focus is right now. We're still learning what our needs are in terms of um, training for the community. We want to make sure that that's based on, on needs that uh, professionals and families want to have more access to. And as we move forward, we're just excited to hear the things that have gone on in other counties and, and think ahead to what services are going to be available in our own communities. Okay, thanks, uh, Leah. And as we look at kind of <clears throat> finishing up the portion of our presentations that focus on some of the work that's, uh, that's been done over the last couple of years. We want to allow Haley to share her story. You'll hear, you know, she's somebody who is really struggling with uh, wanting to go to school or going to school and how some of the grant money was able to support some of the existing initiatives to, uh, uh, to help her, her and her grandmother and father along.
last year at this time, Kaylee would be the good school. She was going to a different school. Okay. She chose to repeat the other school because like the teacher just totally opposition. She got to the point where she would not listen to me. And boys before she had done it was pretty good. And it just got to the point where she wasn't listening to me. She wasn't listening to me. So, you know, she was kind of spiral down, I guess. Haley's been with me for since she was three years old, basically. Um, we got some issues last year at school. Um, we got involved with foster. And then so, she's doing great. Doing great. She's not on any medication now. But um, she was at one time. And then when she moved in with her dad, which caused her help us get through that, um, then things turned around a lot. I've been attending school since she had her own. I didn't know her too. I didn't know her too. You did? I didn't know her too. provided so far has uh, touched on a wide variety of topics and at this point we'd like to open up the webinar to uh, questions and answers. You can ask a general question or you can ask a, a specific question of any member of our team here um, using the chat feature on, on the webinar. If your question is for a specific individual, please uh, name that person in your question. And also before we begin the Q&A, our media partners who are participating today are invited to follow up with local contacts through the information that's provided on our website in order to get more specific information as it pertains to your community. Um, the contact information is posted on both developmental disabilities and mental health and addiction uh, websites. So do we have any questions? Not any questions yet. We have no questions. We'll uh, pause here for a moment. Well, we want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us. Those of you out there uh, listening, we, again, appreciate you 
joining us today as well as all of our participants here. Uh, we appreciate you giving up your time to come in, share what's going on with uh, people out in the field as well as with each other. Yep. So. We did just get one question. Are the current awards for FY16 only? The answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it, the program was funded for the biennium, so there will be more awards in FY17. And when do you anticipate initiating the competitive proposal process? Generally, I would say around April or sometime in the spring. So we'll make sure that is um, publicized through both departments as well as local Family Children First councils, because I know that the Family Children First organizations were a partner in many of the funded um, programs over the last three years. Yes, and we did just get a question, will the webinar be posted to the website, uh, DODD's website, and will the PowerPoint slides be available to participants? Yes, we will post it on the Strong Family Safe Communities initiative page that's housed on Ohio Massa's website with the link on DODD's website. And if you type in that shortened URL that's on your screen now, that will take you directly to that page. All right, looks like there is a question for Patty. Has any funding been targeted specifically for children of prisoners, and if not, are there plans to do so? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. One of the areas that we've noticed in our county, and, and Leah, as you talked about, kind of listening to the voices of the families and kind of let that rise, that is, a, that is an area of need as we work with families individually, um, as we meet with schools, we are finding that they would like to have more targeted services for the families that are faced with so many, um, so many of their parents or a parent or a grandparent that's in prison. And so right now, it's as much as we can do individualized, but as more and more we need to look at how do we specialize some services and support specifically for that population. But we haven't targeted that population, but we know that that need has continued to express itself. Um, and, and actually, even in the suburb counties related to the heroin epidemic, you're seeing so many, um, so many individuals going to prison that hadn't before. And so we're having school districts say, do you have specialized service for that? And to build on Patty's comments, this is Tracy, um, we actually have $1.5 million appropriated in our budget uh, this year to um, provide training and infrastructure support around um, connecting children of incarcerated parents or even parents who have been incarcerated with some um, prevention strategies because we know that they are significantly higher risk of um, ultimately being incarcerated themselves due to the trauma that they've experienced by having a parent absent from the household and many other factors obviously because something led the parent to be incarcerated in the first place. So. Um, yeah, look for more information on that soon. But again, that's for training for um, our communities and, and infrastructure support. And Patty, the person who asked that question wanted to get your contact information. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Or I can get her contact info to you. Sure. It's Patty Fester at the Stark County Mental Health and Recovery Services Board. Um, phone number is area code 330-455-6644. Email is pfetzer at startmhrsd.org. All right, do we have any other questions? I think. Okay, again, we stated it up. Oh. See, every time I. <laughs> I think that's a strategy to get questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How have you grown respite services for youth? I, and if, I'll, I'll answer just from kind of our, our perspective is what we found is that they didn't so much need, especially when you're talking about preteens and, and older teens, they didn't so much need to go to somebody else's house to stay overnight. They needed to be, as you saw in some of the videos, just reconnected back to their school, back to positive activities within the community. And sometimes you need to do that through mentor, um, through a supportive person that kind of helps make that happen. 
and then you then it becomes a natural break for the families because they finally have their their son or daughter, granddaughter back in school and busy with activities that promote their self confidence and their youth development. So we've seen that more um, come to pass. We have another question. Um, are there, are we aware of any other counties other than Stark who are offering crisis texting opportunities? They're, they're starting to ask about it. So we're, um, Stark County I think is like the 11th county in the nation that's partnered with, um, or the 11th community that's partnered with Crisis Text Line Incorporated. But that's been growing. Um, since we did that a year ago, and other counties within Ohio since we started that have reached out not only to us to find out how we did that, but then I direct them to Crisis Text Line Incorporated. You can find them on the website. You can call and ask specifically for Bailey, and she'll help you do that. Um, they've been able to work it out where they have the full platform. All they need from you as a community is to market that number the way that your young people will reach it. So any county can reach out to Crisis Text Line Incorporated and develop a partnership with them. And um, I'd be happy to, to answer questions and direct them, but they can go directly to Bailey at Crisis Text Line Incorporated. I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention this morning, and uh, make sure that you're following up with local contacts. And if you're not a grant community at this juncture, look for more information in April about how you could get connected for the next round of funding. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Again, we will post the PowerPoint and the link to the videos on the Strong Family Safe Communities webpage at the URL listed on your screen.